Hi there, John McAdams here. Phil Macero is joining me on this episode to talk about an intense leopard hunt he did back in 2023 with Tanya Blake Safaris in Zimbabwe. We have a great show for you today, and I know you're going to love it. So let's dive right into things with Phil. Well, good morning, Phil. It is great talking to you again. Great having you back on the show again today to talk about Africa and especially this really cool leopard hunt that you went on earlier this year. Yes. Good morning to you too, John. And it's fantastic to be back. Always love chatting with you. You know, so we've talked about all kinds of stuff in our previous interviews. We've talked about hunting buffalo. We've talked about big boars. We've talked about double rifles, uh, different um, experiences that you've had in different parts of Africa. But this is the first leopard hunt that you've ever, or excuse me, the first leopard that you've ever taken. Is is that correct for all those hunts that you've been on? Correct, sir. Uh, uh, it's the first cat hunt I've ever booked, um, although I've had experiences with cats before. Um, but this was the, uh, this was the first intentional cat hunt where it was going to be a dedicated, you know, kind of sit down on a bait and make this happen. Uh, we did it in the Chiriza block of Zimbabwe, which is a uh, part of their national park system. So the rules were, uh, no artificial light. The leopard had to be taken in natural light. And obviously once it's dark, your hunt is done. So it's more of the, the Hemingway silhouetted cat in the tree kind of experience, which reduces your odds. And I'm I'm not poo pooing anybody's means of taking a leopard because it's, they're hard enough to take in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. But this added a bit of an additional challenge. Now you previously had hunted the Teresa block. We talked about this back in episode seventy four. That was where you had your your double buffalo with a double rifle there. So people can go <laughs> l listen to that episode to hear that story. So it sounds like uh, this this area has been pretty good to you over the years. Yeah, Teresa and I get along pretty well. It's it's a great block. It's it's run by the Ambrose brothers, Malcolm and Floyd. Um, and you know they have different professional hunters that come in. But uh, the Teresa block is a pretty famous block, um, right on the Sengwa River, which is a what they call a dead river. I guess it flows only when it floods, when the rain, the heavy rains come. Uh, so it's a sand river that you kind of go across. But it, it's home to a a very wide variety of game. You've got great buffalo, tons of elephant. Uh, plenty of planes game, kudu, zebra, eland, warthog, bushbuck, you know, up and down the list. Uh, but it's got cats, uh, not too many lions. You, we've heard lions roar and they come through quite often, but there's a lot of leopards in here, as you're about to hear. Now, you booked this hunt primarily as a, as a leopard hunt, right? That was your focus going into it, correct? Right, right. I've killed a half a dozen buffalo, um, and I'm not saying that I'm done with buffalo, because if I were terminal or to be executed or whatever the case may be, and I had one hunt left in my in my can here, uh, it would be a buffalo hunt. To me, that's that's the that's the ultimate hunting. It, it's what I enjoyed best. But, you know, I, I was at the Dallas Safari Club show, and I've known Tanya Blake, who is who is the only fully licensed professional hunter who's a female in Zimbabwe. She's the only woman who's got, you know, the full bag license. And we talked about doing a buffalo and some other stuff. And she was, well, why, why don't we do a leopard? And, and the wife looked at me and I looked at the wife and she didn't say no. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we worked things out and, you know, Tanya has a very good reputation with cats. Um, there's a handful of people in Zimbabwe that I, I know really, really know cats well. And she's among, you know, the, 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 the cream of the crop. Now, my, my big thing is being a deer hunter from upstate New York your primary hunting method is to find a stump, sit on it, and wait for a deer to come by. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at 52, I've been doing this since I've been 16. And not to say that I'm bored with it, but it's not my ideal. I like to hunt with my legs. And a leopard hunt is not a hunt with your legs. A leopard hunt is is a chess game. So it's a bit of a different mindset compared to buffalo. You know, you're going to find tracks for the buffalo, and you're going to walk with the trackers and all of that. With a, with a leopard, you want to bait him. Um, so what you want to do is put up a quarter of a zebra or whatever meat you have available. Uh, we use zebra. And uh, you want this leopard to find a piece of meat stashed in a tree that he didn't kill and knows it's not his, but he wants to steal. Mm -hmm. And you want him to do this in daylight. One of the smartest and most elusive predators on the planet Earth. So it's, it's, it's to say the least, it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge. And I knew it no one in. But yes, this was the primary thing. And I decided it was time for me in my career. Let's try this leopard hunting thing. And, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny because I was I was at the show and Craig Boddington and I were talking and, you know, he does. He said, Phil, I, I spent 63 nights in a blind before I had a crack at a leopard. <laughs> well, thank you for cursing me, Craig. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so 
booking this as a primarily a leopard hunt, was it a 14 day safari then? Correct. It's a 14 day. Well, what I had to do, I, I only had, I think we had 11 days. So I asked Tanya to pre bait for me. Uh, and she had taken a zebra and put up some quarters and started to hang baits and what have you. Uh, she runs a lot of trail cameras. I brought over some of those solar charged spy points, which worked out real, real well because batteries are hard to get in Africa. Number one, ridiculously expensive. And to have one solar charge was really neat. Uh, we, we did have a hyena eat one, but you know, oh. that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Um, what ended up happening though, was we didn't have a cat feeding by the time I got gotten there, they had tracks in the river and stuff like that. So on day one, it was essentially day zero, if you will. You know, the, yeah, the baits were up, and and but we hadn't had a blind built, and you know, the routine is is kind of like this. <clears throat> you know, you'll 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 get your baits hung in areas where they have either seen cats before, or they find spore, or they find scat, and then it's just that you wake up in the morning, get on the truck after coffee and breakfast, and you you just go and check the baits. Now you want to hang your baits. It, there, there's a there's a science to this almost you want to hang it where you can visibly see it from a roadway so that you don't have to you know get off the car and walk in mm -hmm. in, in other words they're not a cat wouldn't be nearly as as fearful of a vehicle as it would be you on foot mm -hmm. uh you want to be able to check your bait if you see it's been hit you get out or you drive right to it if in in most instances and check the camera cards. You know, do we have a leopard on here? Was it a genet? Was it a hyena? Uh, you know, could it be a lioness? Because they will climb trees. So there's all sorts of different scenarios. And then from there, you spend your day checking baits. If you have one hit, then obviously you want to see, is it is it a good tom? Is it a female? And if it's a good tom, you start building a blind. So I think we had we had three days, four days of that where nothing was getting hit. And, and of course, I was getting a little... Getting a little apprehensive, as, as is my nature, and she said, "Don't worry, you know, pats me on the shoulder. We're going to get this done." And, and one day we we rolled into a particular bait uh, in a little sand river, um, and I looked, at, you know, with the binocular, I looked at the, I said, "That's been hit." And the tracker goes, eh, "Maybe Janet, maybe Janet." One, I said, "Okay, well, you know, whatever." We got there, and it was hit by not one, but it was two leopards. Hmm. Once we pulled the cards. Uh, there was a female that had come in first and she, you know, did her little dainty snacking. And then a, a good Tom came in. I mean, he was, you, you know, what was that O'Connor that wrote the big ones look big. Yeah. <laughs> well, you could tell, you could tell in the photo that he was big. So they had seen tracks in the sand river in this area. And one of the uh, uh, Shushi had told me that this leopard was limping. One of the trackers. What do you mean he's limping? I can barely tell a hyena from a leopard track. He goes, no, 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 Bonnie. Look, his left, his left foot is hurt. Maybe snare, maybe, you know, whatever. He broke something or shot at. Uh, he was limping on his left foot. I said, okay, if you see it, I believe you. And lo and behold, you could see when he dismounted the tree uh, on the on the camera, he's limping on his left foot. Wow. <laughs> said, yeah, right? right? I mean, it's crazy. So we we get very excited. Now we've got a female and a male on this bait. and. Now it went from mundane riding in a truck with a stinking gut bucket behind you to freshen up the baits to, oh my Lord, it's on. And out come the machetes and the axes and the bailing twine and all the other stuff to build a blind. And about 60 yards away across this little sand river, uh, Tanya builds a blind, uh, natural materials. You know, she used a, a little bit of, of netting for the roof to keep this, the glare off of us and to keep the bugs and the, and the heat down. Uh, but, but all that, and, and within, I don't know, two hours, it, it, you couldn't even tell it was there. You know, it was amazing. I could have given me all day. It would have looked retarded, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really just, it would have been silly. Um, the, uh, the blind was up and we decided we were going to sit that evening. Now, the nice thing about modern technology, you know, different than it was 20, 25 years ago. I don't know if you remember, there was, used to be a thing called trail timers. Uh, where you, it was a, like a little digital clock and you, across the base of your tree, you would put a piece of fishing line. And as the cat went up and, and tripped the line, it would stop the clock. So mm -hmm. you knew what time a cat was coming in, or they used to do it with a, with a actual, with a, with a digital watch. Uh, you know, the, the, the trip line would pull the battery out. Mm, okay. So bottom line now with, with modern, you know, video cameras and, and trail cameras and stuff, you can really. It, it, some people, oh, it's cheating. It's not cheating. You know you're going to shoot the right cat, or you know you don't want to sit that because it's the wrong cat. And I think it's a better way of of judging 
what we're hunting here. Because I mean, you know, look, leopard are protected animals and they're, you know, very, very valuable. You certainly don't want to shoot a female uh, mistaking it for a male. Cause I think it's like a 20 or $25,000 fine. So it was very nice to know that, yes, we had two leopards on here. Yes, they are two very different sizes, but we had a leopard. You know, mm-hmm. that was the bottom. So they were checking his tracks and where he was coming in from and coming back. And uh, the, the other tracker, Bonnie, he comes over and he hands me a handful of these uh, little red beans. And they're called lucky beans. You know, they're just a particular plant that grows here. So I kind of stashed them in my bag. And I said, you know, maybe maybe, maybe this will work. So cut cut the story a little bit shorter. We sat two nights and didn't have him went back and checked the camera and he had been there on the bait until about an hour after daylight mm-hmm. so now we knew he was he, he was heavy on the bait the female hadn't been showing up as much but the tom was and we knew he was trying to hang near it so we we decided to get up real early and and hunt him the next morning so i think we were up at three you know, made our merry way. We had already made a a clear path, you know, to the back side of the blind. And, you know, that was quite a bit of an effort to boot. Uh, But we snuck in in the pitch dark and we didn't hear anything. And we sat there till probably 9, 930, hoping he was going to come in and feed late, but he never did. So I, I, you know, here, here I am in the blind getting kind of disgruntled, but not trying to show it. And Tanya looks at me and smiles. I said, what's up? She goes, well, he wasn't here feeding this morning. I said, okay. He had, you know, when we finally pulled the cards, he had left probably 5 a.m. She said, uh, which means he's going to be here tonight because he's going to get hungry. Mm. But I said, okay, this is going to be cool. So I try to, you know, maintain my composure. We get back in the blind about three o'clock and I'm, I'm nodding off and falling off to sleep, trying not to snore. And just before, you know, in the, in the classic story, just before dark, it, it probably, if I, I'm remembering right, it gets dark at like 630. So maybe 620. You start to hear the bush buck bark and all oh, the elephants are making racket and then the baboons go crazy. So, ah, well, you know, maybe not. And we, we had five minutes, John, and, and it, like liquid, this thing pours up in the tree Oof. and, and my, my jaw drops because to see them on camera is one thing. But if you've never seen a leopard go up in a tree or just come into a bait. It's it's an experience that that you'll never ever ever forget ever. I mean, it's just it's just amazing. So he's in the tree, but here's the issue: we're losing light quick. Tanya's looking through the binos. We're waiting to see a we we need to get a shot, but b more importantly, we have to make sure it's not the female. Mm-hmm. Now it's only sixty yards away, but it's in that grainy half light, still legal. But you know now now it now it's on, and I start to get the shakes, which is I guess what you pay for, right? Right. <laughs> So I'm on the gun. I got, I got the, a beautiful little loophole, the two to 10, you know, dialed right down. It's nice and bright. It's got a little fire dot right in the center of the crosshair. And I'm watching this, this pat go up and down the chain. And then all of a sudden he's down out of the tree and he's back up in the tree. You know how cats act. They're like house cats, but just 150 pounds. So she's going, I, I can't, I can't discern. I, I'm not a hundred percent certain it's the Tom. And finally, the cat gets up in the tree, reaches his his right paw out, and pulls an entire zebra leg to his mouth. And she says, that's the Tom, shoot him. (laughs) I said, okay, because the female wouldn't be strong enough to do that. Okay. So the cat's slightly quartering. He's feeding. I get the safety off. I calm myself as best I can, which probably wasn't very good. And I put it where I want the, the bullet to go, and I break the trigger. And, you know, this Ramirez gun is a shooter. It's a three quarter minute gun with, with a, you know, a good trigger and great glass and in nine, three sixty two. So I've got enough bullet and I see the muzzle flash with my left eye. There was no flinching. There was no nothing. The shot went true. I hear the bullet hit. And, and then the silence, you know, my ears start ringing for what's left of my hearing. And she punches <laughs> me in the arm, <laughs> punches me in the arm. She goes, you knocked him out of the tree. She goes, but I think he ran, he, he didn't run, but he trod it off. I said, okay, but he got knocked out of the tree. All right, that means we hit him hard. Not a problem. Now, ironically, my wife, who I love dearly and was on safari with me, but can't sit still, was with the camp manager about a quarter mile away up on a bluff having sundowners, <laughs> and they heard the shot. <laughs> so we kind of gather our composure, give the cat a half an hour to lay down, and they meet us at the bait with all the trackers and everybody celebrating etc cetera, etc cetera. we take a look and there's blood underneath the tree clearly there's blood up behind the bait but we don't have the cat mm-hmm. 
Okay, so all right, let's figure this out. Now we got to we got pitch black, and we've got to follow up a wounded cat in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did, you, did you want the full Monty, sir? Can we get you the ticket for the entire experience? <laughs> full meal deal. <laughs> exactly. Give me everything you got. So we ended up with uh, Tanya had her 416 Rigby. Uh, Floyd was there, the camp manager. He had a four, uh, what do you have, a 458. I had my gun. I took the scope off, went back with the iron sights. And uh, the tracker had Tanya's other 308. And a bunch of guys with flashlights. So like a little merry band of fools. We go off in the dark, in the thick stuff to find a wounded leopard. And I'm going to tell you, and, and if the, the listeners could possibly understand, if you're listening to this, you're probably a hunter and you've entered and exited the forest and the woods and the thick stuff in, in the dark, out of the dark, whatever the case may have been. To do that with a known wounded 150 pound furry razor blade ready to eat your face off at any minute is a bit of an exhilarating experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you kind of, you know, make your peace with God. This is cool. Uh, and you, you want to be able to shoot clearly without, you know, a lot of guns, nervous people. You never want to have an accident that way. So muzzle control and trigger control and all of that stuff is paramount. Uh, but a leopard will hide behind a bush that you wouldn't think would hide a, you know, would hide a rabbit and they'll just come at you. So this goes on. We follow blood. They're they're looking. They're talking. They're examining the blood. They're they're looking. We we think you hit him in the neck. And I'm like, no, no, I didn't hit him in the neck. No way, no way that gun. Unless the gun's broken, I, I didn't hit him in the neck. Mm-hmm. He goes up around a hill, and I thought we went a long way. In retrospect, it was probably only 200, 250 yards. And the cat had laid down. It was bleeding good, but he wasn't dead. So we. What he's trying to do in retrospect, the cat was making a circle, almost coming back to the bait because there was a particularly thick patch of Jesse bush. And if you don't know what that is, it kind of looks like a dark green leaf. You know, a forsythia plant will come up and then almost like a waterfall. Or something. It'll come up and then go back down to the ground mm-hmm. and it's got a little area. under. Well, that's what this is, but on steroids. And it's so dark underneath that at noontime, you need a flashlight. So he's making for this stuff. And in the dark, Tanya says, look, we're going to hang a, a little piece of toilet tissue here or whatever to mark the spot, and we're going to come back in the morning. She goes, we're, somebody's going to get scratched in this thick stuff. I said, okay, not a problem. Now, now, at that point in time, I'm entirely dejected. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I've cocked this up. I mean, it's a gorgeous Tom, and somehow or another things went wrong. So we're on the way back, and uh, she just looks at me, and she says, look, this is not the first time I've done this, not my first rodeo. Listen to me. We're going to get your cat. I said, yeah, what, what about the hyena? She goes, we'll get in there as soon as it's full light. We're not going in half dark. As soon as it's full light, we're going to get in there. So I spend a fitless night and a couple of G&Ts, and the wife's looking at me like, you know, it'll be okay. I said, yeah, no, no, no. I bought this one. So I, I do my best to, to keep my game face on and get up again in the morning, and out we go, and we find the spot where we were. And she takes two steps and you hear this thing rustling underneath this Jesse bush. Now he laid there all night. So two things go through my mind. Number one. Okay. We still got the cat. Mm -hmm. This is awful. Number two, but he's not dead. Yeah. I said, ah, boy, oh boy, oh boy. So now it's one of those, you know, I call them come to Jesus meetings. All right, Masaro, you screwed this up, but we're not out of the game yet. So she kind of peels back and looks at me with, and I mean, she, she got, she got military leader face on. And she said, look, you remember the road where we come in, where we found a lucky bean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She goes, I want you to take big John, who was the government game scout who had an AK 47. I want you to put him where, you know, she indicated a particular spot where the, you know, the trail crosses. Okay. She goes, I want you to back off a hundred yards where you can see him. So you can't hit him and he can't hit you, but this cat's going to come out of this shit. And, and we're, we're going to kill him. When you see him, shoot him. And I, you know, cool. <laughs> like I say, you want to get your money's worth? Here we go. All right. Jeez. Now, now I said, right, what are you doing? She goes, I'm going in that Jesse Bush. And I mean, th- this is, this is crazy. She's got, she knows this cat's wounded. She knows this cat's hit. She knows this cat's going to turn and in they go. So I, I get into position and, you know, it's, it's one of those. You know, situations where your tongue, your tongue goes dry and your hands start sweating and, and things start to move in slow motion. And I've got three go away birds over my head giving a concert. I'm like, boys, I kind of need to concentrate here if you don't mind. <laughs> so 
20 minutes goes by and it's, it's, you know, it's that impatient waiting. 20 minutes can seem like a lifetime during that kind of thing. And I hear the greatest sound I've ever heard. Fuck! I hear her 416 go off and hit something. And then I hear, you know, the detractors start going crazy. So they grab me and we walk around and they're all standing outside the bush. Poor Tanya's shirt is, is ripped up from those bushes. She said, listen, he's, he's gotta be dead in there but we're going to bring the truck in just in case he's not, you know, we want to get the vehicle close and we're going to look real good. Long story short, the cat was dead. She had killed him. She hit him, hit him low uh, and took out the back of his lungs, but he was, he was spent anyway. He couldn't go anymore. Mm -hmm. I think he would have came if she went any harder. But um, when, when Bonnie started pulling that cat out underneath that Jesse Bush, John, he just kept coming. So what (laughs) seven foot nine, from nose to tail over the curves, 152 and a half pounds on scales. Oof. I mean, j- the leopard of my lifetime. And for me, the number one greatest African trophy I've ever taken uh, across, I don't know what's it been, 12, 13 safaris. Uh, and, and the thing for me, though, is what do we, at the end of the day, what do we really collect? We collect experiences, we collect stories. And I, I wrote an article about this for the NRA's American Hunter coming out soon called, uh, I entitled it A Team Effort. Because really, yeah, I, I hit the cat. And it turned out that I had hit him just literally just behind his lungs. She figures he might have turned just as the trigger broke. Um, so it was a little bit far back, but enough to hold him. And miraculously, it held him long enough to keep him, I think, as we kind of postulate, think he was alive and growling all night long to keep the hyenas away. Mm. Because oftentimes, if you kill your leopard, the hyenas will come in. You'll, you might have a patch of fur or a tail, whatever they don't eat. I mean, they're they're, you know they're eating machines. So it all worked out perfectly. And to the universe and the creator, I am eternally grateful, but wow, what a pucker factor that whole time. And the first beer (laughs) after that cat was in the salt was the most delicious beer I've ever. Man, I was getting nervous just listening to the story of you telling it. I can't imagine what it must've been like actually there dealing with that. It was fantastic. It, It really was. I mean, at the same time, I, I don't do drugs, you know. I, I'm a I'm a I'm a drinker, but I'm not a drug user. I've always been a poor drug user. But I can imagine this is what goofballs would be like, where you're taking uppers and downers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've screwed this up, but it's still on. And you know, is, is liquid gold death coming out of the bush at my face? You know, am I am I man enough to handle this? You know, all those questions go through your mind. And boy, I tell you what, I I really wish for all parties involved that I had killed him and he had flopped on the ground like a sack of potatoes and died underneath the tree. But as a writer, boy, what an experience. <laughs> Jeez. My. So when when Tanya found the leopard that morning, did she just see him and, and shoot him there before he was able to do anything? No. What had happened was he scurried off from where we first got, uh, where we left the marker. He had scurried off in that Jess stuff, sounding like more than he was. What I think it was, he was he had bled out pretty hard, and this was the last exasperated breath he had. She was crawling leopard crawling on her elbows and her belly to get underneath there. Oh my uh, gosh. She had Bonnie and a Shushi with her. Bonnie had a 308. Shushi had a big light. And she saw maybe a cantaloupe sized hole through that Jesse bush where she saw spots. Mm-hmm. And she knew it was the cat because his head turned. She thought she saw his body turn toward her and she gave it to him with a big 416 and, you know, hit him and just that, that put him out. That, that did. That, that was all, that was all he had left in the tank. Man, so, so when, uh, geez, so when you guys followed that leopard the previous night, you went 200 yards, marked the spot and stopped. And so you think that leopard was like right there, like 20 yards away from you when you guys, less than 20 yards. Less we than were 20. walking into a trap and she had the wherewithal and wisdom yeah. to stop it and pull out in the morning. It yeah. just, it couldn't, we couldn't have scripted this any better. If I were to write a fictitious leopard story, it wouldn't have been any more fantastic than what happened. Jeez, you know, just, and I, like I say, I'm I'm eternally grateful that no one got hurt and no one got charged because that was my main concern. If someone gets hurt following up my screw up, I'm never gonna be able to live with myself. Yeah, oh, really, so, man. Folks, if you're hunting a leopard, shoot true. <laughs> Jeez, and so I mean, you were using a nine three with you said a 286 grain interlock. Yeah, so I, I had a bunch of different stuff. Um, this Ramirez gun. Uh, well, first of all, let's talk about the gun for a second. Sure. Yeah. Todd Ramirez. Yeah, Todd Ramirez is a buddy of mine. He's a bespoke, you know, a custom gun builder from Texas, and Todd builds a fantastic rifle. So this is a Mauser style gun uh, with Smith, Joe Smithson, the, you know, detachable mounts, which are the highest end mounts you're ever going to find. 
And when I tell you, you know, I'll send you a photo. Todd stocked this in a piece of walnut that you could stare at for weeks. It's just gorgeous. And every screw is timed perfectly. Every single little nuance, the, the bolt shroud, the safety shroud is color case hardened. Uh, the extractor band is blued. The magazine follower is blued. The iron sights are timed with a Warthog ivory flip-up sight. It's just fantastic. Uh, roll leather recoil pad made to my dimensions for me. You know, T Todd wanted somebody to hunt his gun. And, you know, this, this comes with a very hefty price tag that I will never be able to afford. But it's <laughs> absolutely an honor, you know, to spend to spend the time with this gun. Uh, but it was 9362, which was a, a pretty, you know, universal choice because there are, if we saw the right buffalo, we were going to try to take him. Mm -hmm. And 93 is the legal minimum in Zimbabwe. So with a 286 range, I think my hand loads were doing 2310. Uh, it would have handled them no problem. Um, I We had Barnes X bullets uh, from Federal. They had a, a, a load that they do that, that worked real well in this gun. So I had those for the Buffalo. Uh, but I chose the Hornady interlock uh, primarily because it's a, a pretty, oh, it's not soft, but it's it's not a real stiff cup and core bullet. So you'll get good expansion you know, at any distance um, without having to, you know, be concerned about having to go too hard and just whistle through. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, I mean, yeah, I could have gone lighter. There's some 250 and 232 grain loads out there, but I figured at, at the distances you're going to shoot a leopard, I, th I think the longest a hunter's ever going to put a blind away is a hundred yards. Maybe mm -hmm. if, if that's long. ours was exactly 60. I brought a, you know, a, a little cute loophole range finder over. Um, so we measured the, you know, the, the distance and we had sighted the gun and made sure everything was, you know, just spot on. Uh, so, you know, with that gun, it was, um, it was not a problem at all. And those, those interlocks, uh, you know, for, for an affordable traditional bullet, they're one of my favorites. They really are. They've always done real well by me. Yeah. Especially at short to moderate range like that. And especially out of a moderate velocity cartridge like the 9.3. I mean, that sounds like a situation just tailor made for an interlock. Oh, it's, it's perfect. I mean, look, you know, I, I, I shot a lot of them out of a 300 wind mag. So, you know, I'll get two twenties going at 2,500 or one eighties going, you know, almost 3000 even. I mean, it'll, 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 it'll handle that, but it sure shines, you know, my, my little 318 Wesley with a 205 grain interlock somewhere in the region of 2,600. It's just perfect. It's perfect. You know, the, the bullet expands, the bullet holds its weight together. It's got good penetration, all the attributes you want. Uh, would I stuff it in a 300 ultra mag? I mean, it would probably work, but there's better choices for that, you know, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, did you, I seem to remember that you posted pictures of a uh, whitetail that you shot this year with a 9.3. Was this with that same rifle? It is. It is. I, you know, I, I had spoken to Todd. I said, you want me to send it back? He goes, well, don't you want to hunt it? I'm like, yeah, I want to hunt it. <laughs> he goes, well, keep it, for deer, keep it for deer season. So I, I had an eight-pointer present a shot on opening day and, and one, uh, one 286 grain Barnes X. Uh, and I had Barnes with me because his bears where we hunt too. Um, one, it just put him down like, like nobody's business, like a hammer. Uh, but surprisingly, very, very little meat loss. And you won't believe this. I recovered the bullet out of a whitetail. That is interesting. What was your shot angle on it? Uh, quartering away. So um, kind of poked it up through the uh, through the outside rib and, and into the offside shoulder. Uh, and, and I was shocked when the deer came back from the butcher and he, the bullet was in there. 100% weight retention. So it weighed exactly 286.0. And, you know, it expanded just fine. Deer fell over about like the hand of God hit him. Uh, so there's something to be said about heavy bullets at moderate velocity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm looking at your Facebook post on it right now. Yeah. You said it expanded to 0.68 inches. So 1.85, uh, times the original diameter. What more could a guy ask for? Yeah. Not, not, not much at all. Now with, with the leopard, you're using that interlock. I'm assuming this interlock exited the leopard. Yes. Yes. Went, went right through. Since you hit him a little far back, did you hit his liver? I don't know. And the reason I don't know is because the second shot that Tanya took kind of made, uh, mm. made soup out of what was inside. Yeah. So there was, there wasn't, you know, time for a proper autopsy, but you could see the entrance and exit wound. You know, it had expanded it, or at least appeared to. Um, yeah. Oh, oh. And one very, very interesting little fact mm -hmm. when we got the cat and I, I remember they were talking about that limp and Tanya points down, she goes, uh, look at his leg. You could see 
where another leopard had bit him in the leg God. and there were there were two teeth marks like a vampire got him. Man. And he bit him so hard he was limping on it. Now his face is all scarred up, which tells me that there's another Tom he's fighting with. And this guy's a bruiser. So if there's another Tom putting a hurting on him like that, there's another big cat in that particular area. Jeez. Not to mention the you know, innumerable females that are running around. Man, I could only. I'm very curious to see what the heck that cat looks like and see how badly he's scarred up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, he's either like a little banny rooster who just doesn't care about size. <laughs> but yes, getting back to Teresa, it, it's just it's a magical block. It, it, it for me, it's been very very special. Now, when we uh, when we got the leopard out of that Jesse Bush and then we took him out to the Sand River for photos, and made a nice little mound. And you know, Floyd comes over the the camp manager Floyd Ambrose, and he says. Um, Sitatunga, that, that, that's the, the company that has Sitatunga Safaris here has been pretty good to you. I said, yeah, it has. He goes, you know where you are, right? I said, I'm, I'm right here, Floyd. <laughs> what, what do you mean? What the hell kind of question is that? He goes, no, 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 turn around. And I'm looking across the river going, but this is where we hung the boat. What do you, I, I'm not getting it, Floyd. He, he walks me out in the river and he goes, now let's look at it from this way. And it dawned on me. When I hunted Teresa in 2018 with Brian Van Blurk, I had taken two buffalo bulls with a double rifle, my, my Heim 470, and one of them, you know, died on the on the opposite shore of the river because we had come from the other way. And the other I killed, finished off at 186 yards in the river, 100 yards away from where the leopard was five years later. Jeez. So it, it's kind of cool. Tanya had me a silver ring made by a lady in uh, in Bulawayo where she lives in Zimbabwe that had the... the uh, the coordinates of what we now named Masaro Beach. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> that part of the river, yeah, that, that's mine now. I, I lay claim to that in Chiriza. Um, it, it just, what are the odds of that happening? Uh, of all the places in the world, you go back to an area and, you, you know, two of the greatest hunting experiences of my life happen within 100 yards of one another. My goodness, that is super cool. And it is interesting you know, if you want to get all woo woo about stuff and everything and be like, oh man, you know, like your, your chi or whatever is just absolutely yeah. perfect there. You know, I don't know what the deal is, but that's maybe one explanation. <laughs> <laughs> when the universe, you know, offers an opportunity, you take it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Now you mentioned earlier about what, how much trouble you would have been in if you guys would have accidentally shot a female leopard. Can you talk about what the legal requirements are for a leopard there? Male, females, or like, uh, an age limit that you're supposed to abide by on leopard, that sort of thing. I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. As far as a Tom would, I know females are off, off limits. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. In some, in some countries you can shoot female leopards, but I, I distinctly remember saying, do not, you know, giving me the drill, do not shoot unless I instruct you to, because if it is a female, you don't pay the fine till I do. I said, Oh, I would probably not be, drinking with you at the next Dallas Safari Club meeting. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the onus is on the uh, on the professional hunter. And like I say, there, there are some good hunters out there. Tanya's among the, uh, among the best. Brian Van Blurk's another great one. Buzz Charlton's a great one. Uh, Teeny Cock is another great one, you know, as far as cats go in Zimbabwe. Um, the, the, it's a specialized means of hunting. And guys either like it or they don't. You know, it's, it's kind of how it seems. Tanya likes it. Brian likes it. You know, they 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 prefer lions, leopards, that kind of stuff. Uh, they like the chess game, but it's that it's that confidence in the identification of the cat. You know, in those low light situations, with a hunter who's going to get all sorts of jumpy on you. You know, because I mean, think about it. How many leopards is the average guy seen in a tree inside a hundred yards? Mm -hmm. Yeah, zero, you know, it, probably. It, it, yeah. It, right? It, it's a very unique situation. I mean, I, I was blessed um, in Zambia uh, years ago on our honeymoon back in 2011. Uh, if if you're looking for a place to hunt cats, you know, Zimbabwe is great, but Zambia is just as good. Uh, the Luangwa Valley is crawling with cats. So we had a situation where I had shot a buffalo on the first day of our safari, um, and I didn't have a ton of money at the time, so I'm kind of going through the price list. And a hyena was 500 bucks. And I looked at my wife. I said, wow, how cool would it be to have like a dirtbag hyena rug <laughs> with his mouth open, looking like something out of the Lion King? Mm -hmm. Let's hunt a hyena. So we hung a, we hung a bait. And it's a very similar process to a leopard, except you actually want it lower so that the hyena can grab it. And, you know, they come in pretty readily. So we built a blind. And uh, on the way, um, Nikki Whiteman was a professional hunter in that Zambian hunt. 
He's uh, he says we had three Mexican clients fly in on, on the previous safari, and all they wanted were tom leopards, and they tagged out in six days. It took three toms out of this particular block in three uh, excuse me three toms in six days, Jeez. and they left early. I said, "You gotta be kidding me." He goes, "Yeah." So I don't, you know, I'm it pretty well spooked out for the leopards. So you know, we'll have a hyena, no problem. So just before dark or before light, excuse me, it's still dark out, and uh, you hear the hyenas yip yip yipping, and then all of a sudden you hear that signature cough. And that's a leopard coming in. And lo and behold, the Masaro luck held. Here comes not a hyena, which I can afford, but a seven foot Tom leopard that walked Gosh. in his shoes on at 30 yards. And I, I didn't have the 10,000 to shoot him, but uh, I did get to see him. And, and to have a leopard Tom chewing on a, on a buffalo shoulder blade at, at 30 yards is quite the experience. So, uh, yeah, the Luangwa Valley is another area where you can, you can really get into a good cat. Uh, but like you asked before, is it a 14 day hunt? It is. So the, it's, it's a bit of a dedicated thing. It, it comes at a higher premium usually uh, in the daily rate department than does a Buffalo hunt. So it's a little bit more expensive. And would I do it for my first dangerous game thing? Nah, I, I, I wouldn't recommend it. I, I want to see a guy do a Buffalo because with a Buffalo comes all those opportunities for planes game and to see different stuff by walking around. You know, with a leopard, you really need to be a little bit more focused and realize you're not going to be spending nearly as much time on the trigger, but the reward is well worth the effort. Yeah. And, you know, you, you, like you said, with your Macero luck, you, you shot that cat early in your hunt. Um, and like you said earlier about, uh, Boddington, and I know there's a lot of guys that are in his, his boat too. Sometimes you go all 14 yeah. days and don't see anything. And sometimes it takes you two, three, four, five hunts like that before you get an opportunity on a leopard. So I was I was talking to a, a dear friend of mine about you know he, he was a professional hunter in Botswana, Jay Leyendecker, and he said, Phil, I bet you could spend a hundred thousand dollars on leopard hunts before you could top that cat, because like you say, you could go fourteen days without even having a leopard hit your bait. You know, if he's got a block of meat somewhere laid up, why would he move? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's it's a real challenge to try and get a cat who is so smart that he knows where he's secreted his meat, what he's killed to find a piece of meat that he knows isn't his in a weird situation and relax enough to present a shot. That takes a lot of work and, and the stars need to align. And God love Tanya. We, we got it done with three sits, four sits, you know, three days. And, and when I told Craig, you, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> and now for once, for once the dice rolled my way. <laughs> Now, did you get to shoot any planes game for bait on this hunt? No, no, I didn't. No, we had we had the one zebra, and uh, my buddy Mike McNulty was with me on the hunt, and he had taken a zebra. So we used um, he, they kept the the rear quarters for meat. We used the front quarters of of his zebra to freshen those baits up. And like I say, we were only there a total of I think six or seven days, so we didn't need that much meat. Yeah, uh, we would have. We were at the stage where we were going to take another zebra. Okay. And so in that area, zebra is is your prime uh, bait for them then as opposed to impala or something like that? It, it is uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, there are impala there. There's plenty of impala there. And impala can make a good bait. But a zebra is a bigger chunk of meat. And the zebra's fat is more resistant to rot and will last longer than will uh, an impala, bush buck, or anything like that. That is a, a very interesting point. Goes also into the uh, just the the strategy and the tactics involved with everything, all the details involved in getting this leopard into mm -hmm. the tree too. And I also imagine that, like you're talking about, that when that leopard was able to reach down and pull up that that zebra leg to eat it, it was obvious. Okay, this is a tom. It's a whole different ball game if that's an impala front shoulder up there too. I, I, well, what they they'll hold they'll uh, excuse me they'll hang the whole impala when they use them. Uh, okay. They'll wire it together over the branch. And, you know, I remember watching old videos where Andrew Dawson would say, if the ribs are crunched and eaten off, it's probably a tom. But if it's on, they're only nibbled around to get the meat, it's a, it's a, it's a female. So it, it's a little bit more difficult to tell just by visually inspecting the bait when you've got, you know, toms and, and, and females on there at the same time. Uh, but with, with modern trail cams, it really tells you the whole story. And that, that was nice. It, it really got me excited because I, 
when you don't have anything going on for three or four days and, and mind you, here's my buddy, Mike shooting everything that always got to offer. He, he went on a tear, buddy. Uh, so I was happy as hell for him, but it's like, ah, I want to play too. And finally this, you know, this guy shows up on camera. It's like, you have my undivided attention. Yeah, I definitely. Yeah. Much more of, um, say, uh, an advanced hunter's pursuit and something that's like you said, more dedicated, more focused, we're going to go and we're going to do this right. And we're going to hopefully have it all come together for us. Right. Right. I mean, so here's the deal with a Buffalo. You never know. You, you, you can't tell by foot size. You can tell it's a big foot. Sometimes smaller Buffalo, younger Buffalo have big feet. And I've seen ancient dog boys have tiny feet. So you, you don't know what's on the other end of the string as, as far as when you start tracking, but it's the, it's the constant involvement and the stimulation of being on the tracks and the suspense of all that. Okay, we blew the stalk and the herd, you know, buggered off because the wind changed. Oh, but look, there's a 55 inch kudu that we can now chew on the way back to the truck. Or oh, we're on our, we're trying to find tracks and we see a herd of eland. So you've got that kind of thing with a leopard. You know, you have to be, you know, you have to be focused on that one advantage. Yeah, I see the kudu, but we're going to lay off it for now because we're going to try and get to that bait. Check this. You know, you don't want to go a couple of days without checking a bait. You don't even want to go one day, really, because if the tom comes in and finishes it, you're, he's gone. Mm-hmm. He's going to go hunting. You've got to eat. So, you know, you kind of got that, that time flow thing going on where he finds it and you find that he found it. Yeah, definitely. And it's also one of these things, too, that people that say maybe they've never hunted Africa before, but they've heard a little bit about it, or maybe they've hunted one time for Plains Game. Oh, you know, I'm out there hunting for kudu and I see a nice Impala, I can shoot it. And and you can, right? And you talked about that with sure. the buffalo and all that. Like, that doesn't happen on a leopard hunt. And even if you have a leopard tag, you're out there, say, looking for bait, and a leopard runs out in front of you, 0% chance you guys are shooting that leopard, even if it does happen, because you got to make, you know, 110% certain that it's a legal leopard and all of that stuff. And, you know. So you- we attract our leopard to your point right here. Mm-hmm. We, we, we attract him, and, and Tanya says, we're going to pull out. And we hung, the, we hung the marker where he was underneath the jest bush, and we had walked out to get back to the vehicle. We walked, I don't know, maybe a quarter mile out to that sand river because it was easier walking through that thick stuff to get back to where the vehicle was. When we got to the edge of the river, Floyd Ambrose sto- he says, stop, and he shines his flashlight, and there's leopard eyes in the grass. Oh, jeez. And I'm going, shoot the cat. That's the cat. Kill him. And he goes, nope. And it was the female. She was there. So imagine that screw up because think about that now. We we had a wounded cat. We saw a cat. <laughs> right. Gosh. Shoot the cat. <laughs> well, so it, yeah, it, it, it takes it takes not only dedication, but some some, you know, self preservation and, and patience not to screw it up by getting overzealous. Yeah. My goodness, man, that could have really turned into a mess. You know, if Think you, about having two cats dead then, right? Or or having two wounded cats running around out there too, shooting at one in the dark. My goodness. And yeah, one one that's illegal to, to shoot too that's wounded. Yeah. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and again, how many leopards have I seen in my life? Uh probably five. And some of them have only been glimpses while we were either driving or tracking buffalo. Like I said, we had the the one very interesting experience where he came into a uh into the hyena bait, but you know, my my time you know, viewing and watching and observing leopards is extremely limited. It's much more on TV and in video than it is on uh, in, in real life. So, you know, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. And when you pay somebody for their expertise and guide, you know, you had to guide you, listen to them. They know what they're doing and you don't. Now, what are you doing for taxidermy with this big Tom? I am out of room. Um, I, I, I have filled my home and my shop and, and my office up. And so most of my things in this life are European mounts, but before everyone throws stones at me, I am unabashedly doing a full body mount on this, on this, uh, cat simply because he, he warrants it. He's a warrior. He's regal. I will probably never top this cat. I don't know if I'll ever hunt another leopard, you know, again, if I have the opportunity and the financial means, I, would I do it? Yeah, I, I, I did enjoy it. Um, but for me right now, this is the leopard of a lifetime. And if I had to meet the maker and sit pat with just him, I'd be totally fine. So I think he warrants a full body mount. Uh, my taxidermist here in New York is a great cat guy. You know, you, you can really tell the, the measure of a taxidermist. 
if their 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 cat's eyes kind of look like they're myopic, then you know you, you, you don't want to use that taxidermist for a cat. Maybe he's good with deer and stuff. But when it, when a when a taxidermist can get the the a cat's face to look like it to look, yeah in English to look like it's focusing on you, that's when you've really got a guy who's uh, got the the skills and talents and attention to detail that you want. And uh, Matt Pigliavento at Lasting Memories Taxidermy here in New York. He uh, he's a good cat guy. He's done mountain lions. I've seen some bobcat work he's done. It's just fantastic. And he was jumping up and down at the opportunity to mount this leopard. So pretty soon he'll be coming home. And I told Matt, take your time. There's no rush. What time of year did you shoot this cat? Uh, August. Okay. And, and that's, that's was that good, just when you had the time to go over there, or is that like a especially good time to to hunt leopard? No, well, it, it worked out that. The way the the antelope were dropping their uh, their young, this was a better time because if there's a lot of calves, you know, being being born and, and lots of easy prey, it's a little bit harder to get a cat to come to a zebra quarter. Makes sense. Yeah, they did to me anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so Tanya had re- you know recommended um, you know August for that, and it was it was rather dry. There were a lot of wildfires. Um, and I mean a lot of wildfires. You could see them burning all night long. Uh, so it was rather dry, and they were they were also concentrated near water holes. So that made it a little bit easier for us to select those areas where we wanted to hang the baits. So what you're looking for is an area where the cat's got access to water pools, uh, where the cat has a a thick place to hide out during the day, and you've got a tree uh, that is easily observable across some sort of barrier. So in each particular instance, we would have, you know, had a, a gully or a, a road or uh, in this where, where I shot mine, there was a small sand drainage and we were up on the hill across that. Uh, it kind of gives the leopard a sense of security to come into the bait. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, that, that time of year with the water being a little dried up uh, and a lack of, of easily obtainable food in, in you know, young, young antelope, uh, it, it made sense and kind of hopefully it would put the odds in our favor and it did. Well, so it sounds like you had a heck of a year with all of your hunts that you ended up doing. So what does the future hold for you in 24 and 25 and beyond, do you think? Uh, well, I'll be back in Zimbabwe in three years. I've got a couple of buddies of mine. We're going to put together, uh, not a last hurrah, but we're going to try to get the three of us, you know, finally together all at once over there. Um, not sure what or where we'll do it, but it'll be in Zim because there's a couple of folks we want to hunt with. Uh, and I think I've got something coming up in Namibia um, I'm trying to iron out. But there's nothing really uh, in concrete yet. I'm kind of going with the flow and with the way the world's working and my schedule is. It'll see what uh, see what presents itself. But there's always a good, fun media hunt to do something on. Um, but n- nothing nothing I can tell you, yes, in, in, in concrete right now. All right. Well, good deal. Well, it is, it's always great talking to you, Phil. This was a heck of a story, and I'm glad you <laughs> took the time to share it with us. Any you know, where can the audience go to see more of your work, where where you write, and all of that stuff? Primarily these days, i got three publications. Uh, there's the Gun Digest magazine, which I write for. I've got monthly columns and just about a feature in every one. Uh, quite obviously, the Gun Digest annual, and both of those are available at gundigeststore.com. Uh, I do a lot for the NRA's American Hunter, uh, which is americanhunter.org. And you can go, uh, there's a publication I do a, a monthly piece for called American Shooting Journal. Uh, and I don't know their website, and I should, and I don't, and I'm sorry, but a busy man doesn't know everything all the time. But um, either that or you can find me on Facebook or Instagram, just uh, Phil Massaro, P-H-I-L-M-A-S-S-A-R-O. Give right. it a share, give it a like, I greatly appreciate it. Well, good deal. I'll put links to all of that stuff on there too. And I will put a link to the article that you wrote. You said it's for American Hunter that's coming out on this specific hunt, right? Yes. It's, it's, I'm, I'm thinking it's the February issue. So it shouldn't be too awful long till that's in your mailbox. All right. Well, good deal. Well, Phil, it was great talking to you today. Thanks a lot for joining us on the show. John, always a pleasure to be here. And you have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel right now and hit that like button. Just click on that thumbs up button and the red subscribe button below the video to make sure you don't miss out on any of my new videos about hunting gear reviews, cartridge comparisons, and more. I've also put links below the video to articles I've written about some of my favorite pieces of hunting gear like slings, ear protection, and scopes. And for more detailed information, 
on popular hunting cartridges and what they are best suited for, click the link in the description below or go to huntingguns101.com and sign up there to get a free ebook I have written on the best hunting calibers. Now I'm going to turn it over to you. Have you hunted leopard before? If so, where did you hunt? How did things go? What did you shoot that leopard with if you successfully took one? Let me know by leaving a comment on this video right now. Thanks for watching. Have a great day and good hunting.